up on global business. Chinese President Xi Jinping emphasized the significance of desertification prevention and control during an inspection tour in Inner Mongolia Autonomous Region. China's first domestically built large cruise liner has left the building dock for the first time, a key stage before its delivery this year. Apple unveils its mixed reality headset at its annual developers conference and we bring you details about Apple Vision Pro. Good evening from CGTN headquarters in Beijing and this is Global Business. I'm Lulu Lu. President Xi Jinping has conducted an inspection in the Banyan city of China's Inner Mongolia Autonomous Region in a powerful endorsement for the country's ecological security and sustainable development, she emphasized the significance of strengthening comprehensive desertification prevention and control measures. During his inspection, President Xi Jinping stressed the importance of comprehensive desertification prevention, emphasizing the long-term benefits and impacts on China's ecological security, strong nation building and sustainable development of the nation. He said that after over 40 years of continuous efforts, China's sand prevention and control work has achieved remarkable results. While overall improvements are seen, there is still much to be done. She highlighted that the period from 2021 to 2030 is critical for consolidating the results of sand control efforts and promoting the high quality development of the Three North Project, which is an initiative aimed at building an ecological security barrier in North China, Northeast China, and Northwest China. He called for more financial and policy support for the Three North Project, establishing a stable and continuous investment mechanism. She emphasized the necessity of implementing systematic conservation and management, calling for comprehensive measures for desertification control. The president said that China should widely carry out international exchanges and cooperation, fulfill the United Nations Convention to Combat Desertification Act actively, participate in global environmental protection efforts, strengthen cooperation with neighboring countries, support desertification prevention efforts of countries involved in the Belt and Road Initiative, lead policy dialogue and information sharing among nations, and jointly respond to sand and dust weather disasters. China has been fighting desertification for years, especially in its northern regions. One major project is the Three North Shelter Forest Program, also known as the Great Green Wall. CGTN's Wei Tong has more. China's efforts to fight desertification in northern China have made major strides over the past decades, but challenges remain. The Three North Shelter Forest Program, launched in 1978, is aimed at planting trees across more than 400 million hectares in 13 provinces in northern China by 2050. Last year, about 850,000 hectares of trees were planted as part of the Three North Shelter Forest Program, which aims to improve the environment in the northwestern, northern, and northeastern China. In Inner Mongolia's Kabuki Desert, the sixth largest desert in China and a major source of sandstorms that affect northern China, over half the area was turned green. See, China has been in the forefront of addressing desertification. It is one of the few countries which in 2003 or 2004 enacted the first national law or policy uh, to address desertification. That shows uh, the keenness and commitment at the national level. Anti-desertification efforts involve a series of social and economical issues. With support from the central government, private companies and social organizations have actively joined the effort. The central government is giving inclusive support to local governments, private companies and the general public in their anti-desertification efforts. Such measures have greatly stimulated the enthusiasm of all parties. According to official data, more than half of China's manageable desertification land has been restored over the past decade. The desertified land area in China has been reduced by more than 4.33 million hectares since 2012. Wei Tong, CGTN.
China's first domestically built large cruise liner has left the, its building dock for the first time, a key stage before its delivery this year. CDTN's Wu Bing has more. Adora Magic City is China's first domestically built large cruise ship. After over three years of construction, it's left the building dock for the first time. From June 1st, the cruise ship started a series of final tests before the undocking today. And as we can see, the ship is now floated and everything is set for the ship to be moved out of the building dock. The undocking process lasted for about half an hour. Several small ships pulled Adora Magic City to the main channel of the Yangtze River Delta and then moved it to another dock alongside the river. It's considered a major step before delivery. This means that all the installation work on the ship has been completed and we move on to the commissioning of the system in the final stage of interior decorations. In 2016, China's State Shipbuilding Corporation, the country's largest shipbuilding conglomerate, together with Italian shipbuilding company Fincantieri, signed an agreement to set up a joint venture with the aim of developing and expanding the Chinese cruise industry. We all know that before COVID-19, China was already the second biggest market in Greece. And more importantly, we all know the potential that this market has. Therefore, I strongly believe that Fincantieri and CCC, they are in the best position ever to develop the Chinese domestic cruise market together in the long term. Adora is over 320 meters long and 37 meters wide. It can accommodate almost 5,300 passengers in its over 2,800 cabins. To build such a ship is no doubt a challenge. The liner has 25 million components, double the number needed to build an aircraft carrier. After the undocking, the ship is expected to conduct two trial sails in July and August. Although it's typhoon season in East China at this time of year, the designers are confident there will be no issues. From the engineering manager's point of view, we just have to do a good job of planning ahead. It is not like typhoons occur every day. We will conduct trial sales when there is no typhoon. But at the same time, we have an emergency plan to pull the ship back to its building dock to avoid any typhoons. The designer says the company has already met its annual goal for new orders this year. With the work beginning last year on another, even larger cruise ship, there's no knowing just how quickly this industry may grow. Wu Bin, CGTN, Shanghai. Well, earlier we spoke to Wang Kun, assistant professor at Hong Kong Polytechnic University on the undocking of Adora Magic City. Wang said that China's first domestically built cruise ship is a milestone in the country's efforts to achieve technological independence. Take a listen. It shows China's growing technological and manufacturing capabilities. As we know, the cruise ship is far more difficult to build than other types of ships like container ship or dry box ship. So not so many countries have this capability. So it's really a milestone. And also it shows China can compete with other global players in this manufacturing field and also I think this is not a coincidence. Uh, the debut of the C919, uh, I think recently also showed China has many breakthrough in the high tech and advanced manufacturing fields. China has been recognized as the world's most promising departure and destination market for international cruise ships. Since the opening of outbound group tours, the number of overseas cruise bookings has increased significantly. And some international cruise companies are set to plan the layout of the Chinese market. Our bookings in the second half of last year have exceeded the pre-epidemic level, and the recovery of ferry ticket prices is also very strong. China's cruise market has huge potential and is the second largest passenger source market in the world. As an international cruise company, we will actively plan to deploy our high-quality cruise ships back to China as soon as possible next year. 
In the latest report by the China Federation of Logistics and Purchasing reveals that the PMI for the global manufacturing sector reached a three-year low in May, marking the eighth consecutive month of contraction. On a regional level, Asian and African countries have served as stabilizers for the world's manufacturing sector, with their PMI hovering around the 15 mark, indicating a balance. But the 15 mark acts as a threshold separating expansion from contraction. However, countries in the Americas and Europe have reported the uh, sluggish factory activities as the adverse effects of tight monetary conditions and high inflation continue to persist. And earlier, Chen Jiahe, who is chief investment officer of Novem Market Technologies, shared with us his thoughts on the current status of the global economy and the global manufacturing sector with us. Let's take a listen. Currently, uh, when we look at the global economy, uh, there are uh, multiple challenges. Uh, the rising benchmark interest rate is a continuous challenge. Uh, meanwhile, the inflation that has been put under control in recent months is still a threat. And with this ongoing worrying of inflation, central banks around the world are reluctant to reduce the interest rate, which on the other hand poses a pressure to the economy. Uh, meanwhile, the war is still going on in Europe, which can be a damage to both current economy and future investment confidence. Uh, furthermore, the ongoing trade tension between U.S. and China is also worrying investors and businessmen. And also, let's zoom in a bit on China now. China's composite PMI reached its highest level in May since 2021. What can we infer from that? Well, this tells us about how resilient and strong the Chinese economy is. And don't forget the large growth potential for our economy. Uh, currently, the property sector is still posing some pressure onto the Chinese economy. That is why we can see that the economic indicators are not that high. But the PMI tells more about the confidence rather than the current status. And from subsectors besides the property, such as online shopping, uh, tourism, trade, as well as the new energy sector, uh, we can see that the economy is gradually recovering. All right, Jiahe, which sectors do you think uh, that have the greatest potential for growth in manufacturing? But when we talk about the greatest potential for growth, um, then that's definitely, first of all, it's a technology, AI related, these kind of things. I mean, uh, traditionally, they're not part of manufacturing, but nowadays it's a kind of new technology that's joining uh, the manufacturing. Also, there is a new energy side, which is really important. Currently, China is picking up very quickly on this side if you look at uh, the growth rate of our new energy sectors. Uh, but on the other hand, the traditional side, uh, it shall not be forgot, such as um, the trade, the manufacturing, the traditional manufacturing, as I say, uh, these kind of things, because they actually provide a large amount of employment. China will host the 14th annual meeting of the new champions, also known as the Summer Davos, from June the 27th to the 29th in the eastern coastal city of Tianjin. Over 1,500 global leaders and innovators from various fields are expected to attend the meeting this time, which will focus on entrepreneurs, uh, entrepreneurship, the driving force of the world economy. And still to come here on Global Business. China's new energy vehicle makers reported robust sales growth in May, and EVs are expected to make up 36% of China's car market in 2023. Three hundred sixty degree profiles of industry movers and shakers, tech mavericks, and policymakers. We drill down on their success. We ask how they set strategy and how they navigate in an increasingly competitive market. Real talk, real business. Join the conversation. Biz Talk, only on CGTN. Major Chinese new energy vehicle manufacturers such as BYD, Li Auto and Ion have reported significant year-on-year -year sales increases for the month of May. As a result, industry associations predict that sales of new energy vehicles in China will continue to rise rapidly with an estimated growth rate of about 50% for the entire year. Experts also project that the NEV penetration rate, which refers to the percentage of new energy vehicles in total 
car sales will increase to 36 percent. And it's attribute this growth to tax rebates and improved charging infrastructure, which have effectively stimulated domestic demand for NEVs in China. CRRC Tangshan, a major Chinese high-speed train manufacturer, has delivered the first new energy light rail train for Argentina that is also the first of such trains to be exported by China. The six-axle articulated train is powered by lithium ion uh, phosphate, phosphate, phosphate batteries where well, the train runs with a maximum speed of 60 kilometers per hour with a flexible passenger capacity from 72 to 388 people. And after being shipped to Argentina, the train will mainly be used on a tourism route in Hujui province. China and Argentina has recently signed a cooperation plan in Beijing aimed at jointly promoting the Belt and Road Initiative, a move that's set to boost economic and trade ties. Our reporter Olivia He spoke with the director of the Argentina-China Research Center to get his opinion on this key development. Take a listen. How do you envision Argentina's economy benefiting from its partnership with China on the Belt and Road Initiative? We already have a comprehensive a strategic partnership with China. So in that sense, joining the Belt and Road Initiative has been like a natural step forward in our bilateral relationship. I think it is a unique opportunity to expand all fields of our economic relations. And maybe the most important regarding the Belt and Road Initiative is the possibility to receive new flows of investment for new projects that will be key for Argentina's future economic development. Having said that, it is our responsibility uh, to work hard to make that happen. What do you perceive as the significance of Argentina's currency swap agreement with China for the country's current economic condition? And how do you predict that other countries in the region responding to such a partnership? The swap has been another demonstration of China and Argentina uh, deep friendship, having taken the relationship to a new level of cooperation. I think the swap agreements have also been beneficial to other countries in the region, and it is a natural path to follow given the fact that the renminbi has become a strong international currency and most of the countries in our region uh, has China as main or second uh, trade, uh, largest uh, trade partner. So why not use uh, renminbi for bilateral trade and even as the currency to finance the investment flows uh, coming from China. In the case of Argentina, the problem is that our central bank has run out of US dollars at the moment, and this administration is willing to use the swap also to contain the ongoing currency crisis. The swap, of course, might be helpful for that, but it will not be the final solution uh, of the problem. I think, uh, on the contrary, we should be carrying out uh, changes in order to increase our productivity and be able to export more goods to China. Uh, so the priority maybe should be to reduce our huge bilateral trade deficit. It is a problem that other neighbors does not have, but we still have. And China is open to buy more from Argentina. So we definitely have to take advantage uh, to that. In the meantime, of course, the swap will, will help us a lot in order to use renminbi to pay for our imports uh, from China. And the last question is, in what ways might RMB internationalization benefit the Argentine economy and its efforts to diversify its financial partnerships beyond the US dollar? Given the, the current uh, critical economic situation Argentina is uh, suffering, the access to RMB has become vital. On the other hand, the RMB internationalization is a solid trend in the world economy with China already representing 20% of the world GDP and being at the same time uh, a major lender for developing countries such as Argentina. That is why we can expect other countries like Brazil, Bolivia, Peru uh, to move forward using renminbi in the near future as an alternative to US dollars. This is already happening uh, and I think it is an irreversible trend um, by the way, we must take into account how weak is the U.S. economy uh, right now. It is precisely the right time for Latin American countries to reduce um, our strong dependency 
with the US dollars. If we continue waiting, it might be too late in this regard. Well, today marks the Mang Zhong or grain in ear in English, which is a traditional Chinese solar term that signifies the ripening of crops and a busy time for farmers. We zoom in today on China's only tropical province of Hainan, which is looking to achieve high efficiency agriculture in conditions not experienced elsewhere in the country. The province is increasing investment in mechanization and smart technology to increase rice production. Lin Wo has the story from Hainan. Farmers in Hainan have been busy harvesting and drying rice. Hainan's grain planting area accounts for about 144,000 hectares, with about 80 percent devoted to rice. By the end of May, about one-third of the rice crop had been harvested. We expanded the planting area through made-to-order farming and transferring management of large areas of land to the professional agricultural cooperative which has also improved from a enthusiasm for grain planting. This year, Hainan received 29.5 million yuan of subsidies from the Chinese central government and almost 6 million yuan from the provincial government for mechanization to improve production. Meanwhile, 10 cities and counties such as Haikou, Sanya and Wenchang have promoted the use of photovoltaic control irrigation technology. More than 85G intelligent irrigation projects have been built, benefiting more than 6,000 hectares of land. We will continue to strengthen staff training for agricultural production and formulate policies to attract more personnel and more investment. Farming and production in Hainan will be further helped by the proposed Sanya Southern Reading Mechanized Scientific Research Center and the Danjo International Research and Development Center for Tropical Crops and Agricultural Mechanization. They will focus on key agricultural processes and mechanization technologies. Lin Wo, Sansha Satellite TV in Hainan for CGTN. And still to come here on Global Business. Apple unveils its mixed reality headset at its annual developers conference and we bring you details about Apple Vision Pro. The world economy as we know it is about to change. Global business reports highlight emerging markets, developing countries and dynamic sectors worldwide. We feature top analysts and newsmakers to provide perspectives on every facet of business. From an on-the-ground perspective, we provide you with balanced and objective assessments. Fast, sharp, and insightful. Global Business. Only on CGTN. Tech giant Apple is going all in on the world of mixed reality. The Silicon Valley tech giant made the eagerly anticipated announcement at its annual developers conference. Mark New has the details. At Apple's worldwide developer conference, CEO Tim Cook pulled out the famous line from the late Apple founder Steve Jobs. But we do have one more thing. He announced Apple's launch into the world of augmented reality. Today, I'm excited to announce an entirely new AR platform with a revolutionary new product. And here it is. It's called Apple Vision Pro, part of a category the company calls spatial computing. The headset is a mixed reality device where images are overlaid while the user maintains vision in the real world. We set the ambitious goal to design an incredibly intuitive input model for spatial computing one that could be used without controllers or additional hardware. Apple Vision Pro relies solely on your eyes, hands, and voice. Icons respond to where one's eyes look. Gestures allow users to select and scroll. Competitors have launched spectacles and headsets in the virtual reality and augmented reality space well before Apple, such as Google Glass, MetaQuest, as well as products from hundreds of companies. But when Apple moves into a space, it does so with full force, often devouring the competition. One of those competitors is Chinese company Xreal, which first launched its AR glasses in 2020. Co-founder Peng Jin says he actually welcomes Apple's entry into the extended reality space hundreds of millions of people starting to pay attention to what's happening in the AR space. So, you know, from that perspective, I think it's super helpful. It's kind of a, a huge proof point that, you know, the, the biggest tech company in the world, the most successful, 
is also jumping into the XR space. I think that's a signal for a lot of people and a lot of the skeptics in the media that were starting to say, you know, the metaverse is dead. Known for superlatives at their events, Apple called the product the most advanced personal electronics device ever, noting that it filed more than 5,000 patents to create the device. That's being used to justify its premium price of $3,500. At the event, Apple also introduced a new 15-inch Mac Air laptop, as well as its latest Mac operating system called Sonoma. Bark New CGTN, San Francisco. Recent data shows that Africa continues to receive the bulk of used clothes, mainly from Europe, some of which cannot be worn or resold. Developing countries often lack adequate waste and recycling infrastructure to deal with textiles, meaning that these unwanted garments ultimately end up in local landfills and waterways. Nairobi's toy market is popular with people looking for trendy, second-hand clothing items from global brands for a fraction of the original price. The traders buy them from importers who bring in tons of used items, mainly from Western countries. The owners only wear them for a short while and then send them to countries like Kenya. They are then sorted according to their quality. The ones we call first camera are of the best quality. Then there's the middle grade. They're not that great, but they're wearable. Millions of Kenyans often frequent markets such as this one in order to purchase second-hand items of clothing. However, the consignments that bring those clothes often also bring with them waste, items that cannot be reused or resold. And that's where the idea of recycling comes in. It's a problem that companies such as Africa Collect Textiles are trying to solve. Every day they collect used clothes from the public. From their little workshop in Nairobi, they take apart and turn used garments into fresh reusable items. But not all the waste can be reused. Europe generates approximately 5.8 million tons of textile waste annually. While some textile waste is recycled within Europe, the majority is exported to Africa and Asia. A Greenpeace report, however, says that 30 to 40 percent of such second-hand garments are of such poor quality that they cannot be sold anymore. Developing countries often lack adequate waste and recycling infrastructure to deal with textiles, so the unwanted garments ultimately end up in landfill sites and block waterways. Recycling offers one solution to tackle the problem, but recyclers can only do so much. The production, consumption and improper disposal of synthetic textiles is reported to contribute to greenhouse gas emissions and deplete non-renewable resources. And analysts say the real solution starts at the beginning of the chain with the production of durable, good quality textiles. Our materials are just made from the cheap, um, or from the synthetic fiber or, or, or what we call the microplastic or lycra, ETC. Then, um, once it ends up in the value chain, we'll never do anything with that. But if it was, for example, the, the cotton ETC, maybe we could, we could extract the cotton from T-shirt and then um, sell it, the, the mix with the cotton with the other virgin material to produce other brand new items. They also call for more support for and awareness of recycling. Ultimately, however, experts say the world needs to move from fast fashion and excessive consumption. Until then, with constant production and then discarding of textiles, the work of recyclers can only feel like a drop in the never-ending ocean of waste. Wilkesanya Wasujitian. And that'll do for this edition of Global Business here on CGTN. Thanks for being with us. I'm Lenulu. Till next time, bye for now.